Well, thanks everybody for logging in tonight. Uh, as Dan said, my name is Matt Cornus. I'm a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service out of the Green Bay, Wisconsin office. Um, and I'm going to be sharing some study highlights from the Great Lakes Fish Tagging and Recovery Program tonight, um, also called the Mass Marking Program. Typically at this meeting, we share updates from everything we learned from the past field season. And unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we weren't able to collect fish in 2020. Um, we are onboarding technicians and plan to be back out there this season. So look for our techs at tournaments and boat cleaning stations. Um, really looking forward to getting new data again this summer. So uh, taking a slightly different take tonight, and instead of covering updates from last year's field season, I'm going to be highlighting some of the scientific publications we've had come out of our office over the last couple of years. So um, not sure why we're not advancing the slides. Oh, boy, that's really zoomed in. Uh, let's see here. There we go. All right, so uh, I'm gonna provide, I'm gonna start with a brief program overview for anybody in the, the, the webinar tonight who hasn't uh, experienced our program yet. And then uh, talk about some data on lake trout survival, Chinook salmon growth, sea lamprey marking on salmon and, and trout species and um, diet and competition. So without further ado with the program overview, the Great Lakes Fish Tagging and Recovery Program is a collaboration amongst federal, state, and tribal agencies that's coordinated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of the Green Bay office. We've been around since 2010. Uh, our main objectives are to address questions on the survival and contribution of hatchery fish, as well as the natural reproduction and other measures for salmon needs. Our funding thus far for the last decade has come from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which is uh, funneled through the EPA. Um, this is non-permanent funding, but it's certainly a program that's been very, very good and supportive of our work um, over the last 10 years. And our program includes four major components, the tagging and marking of hatchery fish, the data collection and tag recovery from the sport fishery, from these uh, fish as they return as adults, extraction of tags and lab processing, and data analysis and support for fishery managers. And I just want to take a quick time out here to thank, uh, thank everybody in the audience um, who has encountered our technicians and allowed us to sample your catch. Thanks to your support, we have records of over 125,000 um, fish in uh, Lakes Michigan and Huron, and that has really allowed us to get at uh, some of these questions that are important to management. So um, first major cog of our program, tag tagging and marking patchery fish. Um, this all revolves around the automated tagging trailers. Um, the hatchery fish are receiving fin clips to their adipose fin and coated wire tags using this system that's capable of processing seven to 10,000 fish an hour. Um, the upper left-hand photo shows the exterior and the lower right-hand photo shows the interior of this trailer. Um, and and the, uh, the tags, and you can see a picture of the tag there on the upper right corner. It's, it's a very small metal filing. It's etched with a code. Um, that code is specific to a particular batch of fish that all share the same stocking location, year class, and genetic strain. So that's all the information we get back from those tags um, at the time of capture. And so we've been able to mark all lake trout uh, since 2010, all Chinook salmon since 2011, and all steelhead since 2017 for a total of 9 to 10 million fish annually um, in Lakes Michigan and Huron. The, uh, the field survey that we coordinate, um, this began in 2012, and it's uh, the most extensive sport fishery survey in Lakes Michigan and Huron um, in terms of specifically targeting the collection of tags. Um, of course, the state creel programs are also very extensive and do contribute data to this data set. Um, but this is a, a map showing specifically the fish and wildlife technicians. They're stationed at six different locations. Um, those are highlighted by the black stars on that map to the right. And every year they sample um, over 40 ports and collect over 15,000 fish from Lake Michigan and the U.S. waters of Lake Huron. And those are all those red circles. Those are port cities um, sampled by our technicians. Uh, and, and this is a, a survey that's provided the most abundant source of samples from many species, um, specifically the Chinook salmon, steelhead, coho salmon, and brown trout. We also see a fair bit of lake trout, but um, uh, lake trout are also fairly abundant in the assessment surveys, the bottom catch gill nets, whereas those specific salmon and the brown trout are not. So um, because of that, we've been able to, to partner um, with a lot of different groups for a lot of different research projects. Um, third major component is the tag extraction and lab processing. Unfortunately, this is not an automated process. So um, good old fashioned human labor 
uh, carefully pulling out these tiny tags from the, the collected snouts in the lab. Um, and thus far, we have about 115,000 coded wire tags recovered um, through 2020. You can actually see a, a nice picture there on the upper right corner of uh, uh, one of the numbers etched in the tag. Um, that little uh, uh, notch in the tag tells you where to start. So that particular number is 640185. Um, that's a lake trout from the 2010 year class um, who stocked in Manitowoc, uh, among a few other lo locations. So um, that gives you some sense of the info we get. Um, we also do a fair bit in the lab with regards to wild fish. So we estimate the age of wild lake trout, Chinook salmon, and steelhead um, using a variety of different structures. Uh, basically, these uh, structures allow us to interpret age similar to how you'd look at rings for a tree, um, and that provides some uh, interesting information on the wild fish as well. And then lastly, and this is what I'll be focusing on the most tonight, is the data analysis and support for management. So these coded wire tags have helped to answer questions about wild recruitment, movement patterns, survival, and growth rates. Um, and of course, these are used in models that help inform management and policy decisions on stocking and regulation. Um, on top of that, as I mentioned, this, this field survey has been leveraged to collaborate on a lot of different studies because of our ability to collect um, specimens, um, and uh, not the least of which is salmon and trout diets. I know Brian's talking about that next. Um, that's something we've been happy to partner with, uh, both with his project and with some of the, the prior diet studies on Lakes Michigan and Huron. Um, we've looked a bit at sea lamprey wounding um, with an emphasis on the non-lake trout species. Um, looking at uh, trying to determine the natal origin of wild fish through otolith microchemistry. So this is a, a pretty cool technique. Uh, basically the trace elements that are in each of these tributaries where the wild fish are hatched um, bond with the uh, ear bones of these fish and are kind of locked in place. And uh, partnering with uh, uh, different groups at, at Michigan State and at Central Michigan University, I'm looking at this for both steelhead and Chinook salmon. Um, uh, we've been able to partner with a study looking at the genetic composition of wild lake trout, uh, mercury biocontamination in Lake Michigan, and then this year we're also collecting specimens to help identify and quantify PFAS chemicals in Lake Michigan fish. Now most of these studies are led by, by partners, um, but it's been, been a pleasure to work on all these things and uh, has uh, all of these issues have helped provide a lot of information to managers and stakeholders about what's going on in the lakes. So. Um, that's a, a very brief summary of, of what our program is about. And now I'm gonna kind of step through a couple of different examples of the, the work we've had um, come out over the last couple of years. So um, one thing we've looked at in particular is lake trout survival. Um, lake trout's been the focus of rehabilitation efforts in the Great Lakes since the 60s. Uh, this is a figure here kind of showing the commercial yield of lake trout and its collapse uh, following World War II in the late 40s and, and early 50s. Um, since that time, multiple genetic strains have been stocked to promote genetic diversity and the use of varied habitats, as well as resilient responses to change. Um, and what I want you to get out of this figure, this, this is a figure showing the number of lake trout stocked every year in Lake Michigan um, with a different color for each of the genetic strains. So um, some of the questions we asked tonight revolve around genetic strain, and this is just an example showing that there is a fair bit of genetic diversity in the, the, the fish that have been stocked out there. So um, main objectives for this particular line of research is to help evaluate the efficacy of the lake trout stocking strategy, asking questions like how well do lake trout survive from different stocking locations and genetic strains, and what strains contribute the most to natural recruitment. So um, I'm gonna give you some answers to those. Uh, first, looking just very coarsely at survival. Um, this was a study that took place, uh, came out in 2019, but, but focused on lake trout stocked in the lake from the mid nineties through the mid 2000s. And um, really kind of identified the survival from these four different stocking locations in the lake. These are priority locations based on the, um, the lake trout rehabilitation plan that's been enacted. And uh, we can see that there's higher survival in the south than the north. So this, this figure is showing uh, relative survival um, and really high from Julian's Reef, uh, pretty high from Southern Refuge and Clay Banks, and, and not terribly high from the Northern Refuge. Um, and some of the issues that we've experienced there is that uh, up north there is a high, higher level of sea lamprey abundance, at least there has been. I know that's come under control over the last four or five years. 
um, fairly substantially in terms of the estimates of lake trout um, mortality from lamprey. Uh, and, and then there's also a, a fair bit of fishery activity up in northern Lake Michigan as well. So that, that helps explain these results. Um, and uh, one thing we can look at here is how this might affect potential for wild recruitment. So lake trout are a really a long-lived fish. Um, we uh, typically, you know, in the Great Lakes, I think that the oldest lake trout we have in our database is like 32 or 33 based on a coded wire tag. Um, that's a very uncommon fish. Uh, most of them are going to be in their, uh, uh, you know, single digits or teens, uh, but they don't become sexually mature and spawn until at least age seven. And if we highlight those age groups in the northern refuge and even at clay banks, you can see that there's not uh, nearly as high an abundance at those mature ages as we've seen at the southern refuge in Julian's Reef. Um, so that, that high level of survival in the southern end of the lake is correlated with an advanced parental uh, structure, stru age structure for the parental stock. And that's uh, contributed to a resurgence of wild recruitment in Southern Lake Michigan. And so this is uh, um, some unpublished data from our lab. One of the things we look at every year is the um, uh, wild lake trout catch punit effort. So this is a indication of relative abundance of wild trout. And you can see that there's an increasing pattern for both Lake Huron and Southern Lake Michigan. Uh, but not as much for Northern Lake Michigan, uh, based on the past six years of data. And uh, this, these patterns are reflected in the, the gillnet assessments as well. Um, so you can see that those uh, recruitment patterns do line up with the survival patterns. Another question that was of interest uh, to management, uh, particularly now, is trying to evaluate um, the genetic strains that are being stocked in the lake. And one of the questions that was asked is how uh, does survival vary amongst those strains? And so uh, oftentimes we observed relatively similar survival, but where we did see differences, it was mediated by stocking location. And so uh, I'm highlighting probably the, the biggest uh, pattern here. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we're looking at lake trout that were stocked at Julian's Reef in Illinois. And the gray bars are Lewis Lake strain and the orange bars are the Seneca Lake strain. So um, the Lewis Lake strain is a Lake Michigan remnant genetic. It was uh, fish stocked in Lewis Lake, Wyoming from Lake Michigan. Whereas the Seneca Lake strain, that, that comes from the Finger Lakes region of New York. Um, and in, in Julian's Reef, for fish that were stocked there, that, that uh, Lake, Lewis Lake genetics really had a, a strong performance compared to Seneca Lake. Uh, if you look at the right-hand figure, these are trout stocked in the Northern Refuge. And here there's a bit of a different story. Um, it, for, for the two oldest year classes we looked at, the Seneca Lake strain, again in orange, um, was higher than the Lewis Lake strain and was uh, equivalent more or less with the Lewis Lake strain for some of those other year classes. Um, so this is what I mean by mediation by stocking location. And what we think is going on here is that the, the Seneca Lake strain has some uh, uh, behavioral characteristics where they likely avoid sea lampreys. So Seneca Lake is a very deep and steep lake and um, there's not a lot of shallow habitat and as a result those Seneca Lake trout tend to occupy a deeper distribution um, which helps them avoid lamprey and so um, during the time of this study when we were, we were looking at these fish um, we did look at sea lamprey wounds per lake trout and the the fish stocked in the northern refuge is that black line you could see that the wounding rates there are higher than elsewhere in the lake for lake trout. So um, what we think is going on here is because of that avoidance behavior, the Seneca Lake strain is performing better than other strains in the northern areas, uh, but strains like the Lake Michigan remnant uh, Lewis Lake strain is performing better where, where lamprey are not as abundant, um, like in the, the southern part of the lake. And uh, this kind of transitioned into a, another question about genetic strain, particularly trying to figure out which strains are contributing to wild recruitment. So this was a study led by Wes Larson, um, who was uh, formerly at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and, and USGS. And uh, what we looked at here um, was to estimate the amount of wild recruits that came from different genetic strains relative to what you'd expect to see based on their stocking numbers. Um, so our, our contribution to this study was helping to um, look at those expected numbers and correct them for movement among different areas of the lake. And what this figure is showing, um, each row is a different area of the lake and each column is a different strain. And those really warm colors for Seneca Lake is indicating that uh, Seneca Lake strain appears to be contributing much more to wild recruitment than would be expected based on how many Seneca Lake fish were stocked in Lake Michigan. 
Um, the second column is the Lewis Lake strain, and you can see a lot of lukewarm and luke cool colors. So those contributions were more or less as we would expect based on stocking numbers. And then those last two columns, the Green Lake strain is another Lake Michigan remnant. And then the superior, that's actually three superior strains combined into one column. Um, those were underperforming based on those cool colors, underperforming relative to expectation. So um, those are some of the things we've been able to learn about lake trout um, just the past couple of years with some of the studies we've been involved in. And uh, I do have a pretty full PowerPoint, so I'm going to move right along here to Chinook salmon growth. Um, so quick transition from lake trout to Chinook salmon. Um, background here that I'm almost sure most of you are familiar with is that the Chinook salmon and other Pacific salmon were initially stocked to capitalize on and control the non-native alewife and create a sport fishery in the wake of the collapsed commercial fisheries for lake trout. So um, obviously a bunch of dead, dead alewife washing up on beaches isn't really good for tourism. And uh, Dr. Howard Tanner, who's pictured at the far right of this image on the right, um, was uh, formerly a Michigan DNR and, and was the, the gentleman uh, who was most behind the introduction of Pacific salmon into the lakes. So um, today, Chinook salmon are a primary target in this, uh, this really important and valuable fishery, um, but they have contributed to declining, declining prey biomass, and, and this has raised, raised concerns about the fishery's longevity. Now, I, it's certainly not the only factor in declining prey biomass. Uh, zebra mussel invasion has certainly played a large role in terms of the abundance of plankton um, and a lot of lower, lower food web stuff. Um, but there is nonetheless a concern now about making sure that predator and prey balance is maintained um, given the, uh, the reduced uh, prey levels in the lake. So um, the objective going into this study was to try to look at the variability in Chinook salmon growth rates during this period of historically low prey and to see if uh, Chinook salmon stocked in different areas of the lake had different growth rates and to see how much uh, growth varied from year to year. So um, we did find that growth was really consistent in both, not only in Lake Michigan, but in Lakes Michigan and Huron combined. What you're looking at here is a figure of total length in inches by age. And each color is a different stocking location um, with that, that Lake Huron, fish stock in Lake Huron is pointed out. Everything else is Lake Michigan. Um, so we have the most data from ages 1.5 to 3.5. And so over those regions, these lines are virtually identical. Um, really consistent growth. And, and this is consistent with what we've observed from the coated wire tags in terms of movement. So um, aside from the spawning season, when Chinook salmon are returning to where they're stocked to spawn, uh, movement is pretty much unconstrained year round, uh, except again for the fall spawning run. Um, and so these are some, some unpublished data, again, from our, our lab with the coated wire tags. And what you're looking at are fish landed at two different locations with the red circles indicating the origin or the stocking location of those fish. So this, this map on the left, that gold star is Manitowoc, Wisconsin. So all the Chinook salmon that were landed at Manitowoc are shown here. And those red circles correspond to where they were stocked. Um, so you can see that fish that were landed at Manitowoc were stocked all over the lake, including Northern Lake Huron. Um, you're getting a, a, a lot of a diverse catch there in terms of the stocking locations. And the right-hand side shows a, a map for fish landed at Frankfurt, Michigan. Um, those red circles are, are very similar. So that, that is showing that this is a, a consistent pattern on both sides of the lake um, where, you know, we have this level of movement. And, and linking that back to growth, when you have a fish that's moving around this lake, pretty much at will, it, uh, it makes sense that there's not gonna be a lot of spatial variability in growth because the, the Chinook are likely following around the prey. Um, it's also consistent uh, with movement from Lake Huron into Lake Michigan. The fact that we see that similar growth rate uh, for, for Lake Huron stocked fish is likely because they're moving to Lake Michigan to feed. So this is a figure that was published in, in 2017 um, from Clark et al. And the left-hand map is, is showing uh, those boxes are age one, two, three, and four Chinook salmon. That's the average recovery location um, for fish stocked at Swan River in Lake Huron before the collapse of alewife. Uh, so that's pre-2003. Um, and you can see that the recovery locations are primarily in Huron. Uh, the figure on the right, is the same for after the, the alewife collapse. And ages one, two, and three are now off the coast of Michigan and Lake Michigan. 
uh, in terms of their, their kind of uh, central average re recovery location. So uh, the fact that we're seeing similar growth is consistent with this as well. It's another indicator that those Huron stockfish are coming to Lake Michigan and, and feeding on, on Lake Michigan alewife, but also being caught by Lake Michigan anglers during that summer season. Um, one thing we did notice is that the growth of Chinook did vary uh, tremendously over time and that that was really strongly linked with alewife density. And uh, I, a few of the uh, folks that I've talked to kind of kind of tell me, well, hey, Matt, this is kind of a no brainer. Um, but it, from from my perspective, it, it really isn't a no brainer because if alewife were really abundant and, and food wasn't really a limiting source, you wouldn't expect to see this tight of a coupling with with a single food source. I think the fact that we see um, such a, a tight uh, pattern here is really related to the fact that alewife densities are, are really low. Um, so to orient you to this figure here, you're looking at Chinook salmon length at age one in blue and year and older alewife density in orange. And the, the variability here is actually really quite large. So I, I kind of put in the, the inches there um, along the, the Y axis. And just in this five year time frame. We had average lengths of age one Chinook ranging from just over 16 inches to nearly 21 inches. So you're looking at almost five inches of variability. And, and that variability is really uh, explained really highly by the amount of alewife out there in any given year, um, which is a pattern you'd expect to see with, with the limited food source like we have. So um, kind of the take home from this is that the, the spatial patterns really support the current management practice of considering Chinook salmon in each lake as a lake wide stock. Um, but it, it also confirms the, the need to, to manage for predator prey bio, uh, balance because of this, um, this linkage here between growth and the amount of food in any given year. Uh, moving right along, uh, we did take some, uh, some time to look at sea lamprey marking and we have a study that's coming out this year in 2021 that's documenting the results. Um, so there's this large investment in controlling sea lamprey populations. That's another really large fish and wildlife program. And this photo here is showing a, a treatment of lampricide in, in, in a stream. Um, and uh, the predation of sea lamprey on lake trout is, is like really, really well documented. It's been, uh, you know, it's one of the major reasons for lake trout collapse. It's a challenge and has been a challenge for lake trout rehabilitation. But what hasn't been looked at as much is lamprey attacks on other hosts, uh, particularly for salmonids. Um, other salmonids may be suitable alternate hosts, um, but the data from the assessment surveys has been limited. Uh, so this was something that we were really well positioned to look at because of, um, you know, obviously angler caught fish were seeing a mix of all five of these species and had the opportunity to look at lamprey marking rates. So. Um, the kind of big take home here is we did find that, Chino that Chinook salmon and brown trout are viable alternate hosts for lamprey. Um, but there's a little more to that story. So if you look at the left hand figure here, this is Lake Michigan. And uh, this is a standard metric. This is A1 through A3 wounds per fish. So a type A wound is the most severe type of lamprey wound. It's like a gouge in the flesh. And uh, type uh, stage one is uh, unhealed at all, really fresh. And uh, stages two and three are partially healed. Uh, stages. So um, that's the standard metric I've looked at to measure lamprey uh, attack rates. And uh, we do see that lake trout had the highest attack, uh, highest amount of wounds per fish at about 5.3% of lake trout with a, a lamprey mark. Um, but we did see uh, fairly decent marking on brown trout and Chinook salmon as well, and very limited marking on coho salmon and rainbow trout. Um, but the really surprising finding is if you look at Lake Huron, and that's the right-hand side, we actually found substantially higher marking on um, Chinook salmon compared to lake trout, uh, which is not at all what we would have expected. Now, one of the things that might be explaining this is that most of the Chinook salmon that we recover from Lake Huron are in that northwestern portion of the lake, uh, and that is an area that has historically had high lamprey abundance due to its proximity to the Manistique and St. Mary's Rivers. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the only other time that uh, Chinook salmon have been observed to have a, a higher wounding rate than lake trout, I think it happened uh, for a couple of years in Lake Ontario, and that was during a time when lake trout were at really, really low abundance. And that's not the case in Lake Huron right now. Um, so this really sent home the message that Chinook salmon are, are being attacked uh, by lamprey and could be a, a viable alternate host for lamprey and, and something that should command some attention. Um, Another thing we found here, and this is a more speculative finding, 
is that Chinook salmon may have a higher mortality rate than lake trout when attacked. And, and that's, a, that's a very speculative statement. Um, right now, this is a hypothesis that, that's informed only by the data we see on the screen here. Um, and so just to kind of walk you through that, this is based on, this, this uh, hypothesis is based on the ratio of fresh and healed wound types. So um, these black bars are stage one wounds, stage one type A wounds. Those are fresh wounds. Uh, and these are all healed wounds. And you can see for Chinook salmon that there's a, a large number of fresh wounds compared to healed wounds. And if we look at lake trout, it's an opposite pattern. We see lots of healed wounds on lake trout um, compared to Chinook salmon. So uh, one of the things that could explain this would be higher mortality, right? Because the only fish that we can observe with lamprey wounds are the ones that survive the attack. Um, and so it, uh, that's, that's one possibility. Now, another possibility, of course, is that um, lake trout are obviously a lot longer lived than uh, uh, Chinook salmon, but the uh, time it takes to get from a stage one to like a stage two or three is, uh, I, I believe it's on the order of months. Um, whereas those stage four wounds you see for lake trout, those, those could be years old, but stage two and three, those are kind of months. And that, that would be within the time span of a Chinook salmon life for sure, which typically is about age three or age four before they exit the fishery. Um, we did see a similar pattern in Lake Huron with, uh, you know, a higher ratio of fresh to healed wounds on Chinook than, than lake trout. So um, this is something that we have submitted proposals for to try to get some funding to look at the physiological response, um, particularly things like the, uh, the fat reserves in, in different fish that have these severe wounds. Um, and that might give us another line of evidence as to whether or not, uh, say, one of these species has a stronger response to being attacked by a lamprey than another. Um, so that's, uh, that kind of sums up this paper that's coming out here this year for lamprey wounding. And um, uh, the last tidbit I wanna share here is some data we have for uh, diet and competition. And um, I know Brian's gonna talk a bit about this, uh, not a bit, a fair bit more detail about this, but uh, uh, this has been a question that's been uh, particularly important of late because the pelagic forage fish have been in decline in Lake Michigan since the early 2000s, uh, coupled with more recent declines in native sculpin and uh, kind of fluctuating, but overall increasing numbers of goby. So understanding how uh, the potential for competition works among these five fish is pretty critical to managing this fishery. And so that's something we tried to get at um, and, and have partnered with lots of different uh, uh, and great uh, um, groups that have, have published some of this. So um, this is a figure that I'm not going to spend a ton of time on because I know Brian is going to spend more time on very similar data. Uh, but the take home for a lot of these uh, uh, studies have shown that lake trout, brown trout, and steelhead have adaptive diets um, compared to the Chinook and Coa salmon, which appear to be more alewife dependent. So this is a figure um, from Leonard et al. 2020. Uh, this is diet data from 2015 and 2016. Um, these red bars are, are alewife. So everybody's eating alewife and, and there's no debate on that. Uh, but here I'm showing um, brown trout um, eating a fair bit of brown goby in blue and lake trout eating those gobies as well. Uh, with steelhead having a fair bit of diet comprised of terrestrial invertebrates. So this is uh, kind of what's backing that statement about those three species being more adaptive. Um, by contrast, the Chinook salmon and coho are, are not only mostly alewife, but the rest of those bars are unknown fish or plankton, which is an indication of like an empty stomach. So um, what we were able to do way back in 2014 is to try to look at this with stable isotopes. And, and that's what I want to focus on for this tidbit. This was a, a study that, that finally got published this past year in 2020. Um, isotopes provide an indication for measuring the potential for competition. And they also incorporate what a fish has eaten over the last several months to up to a year, whereas a, a stomach is going to show you what a fish has eaten the last couple of days. So um, before we can talk about isotopes, I need to quickly kind of go through how we interpret an isotope plot. So um, this is showing the salmon and trout species as different colors and the prey species in gray. And this x-axis, this carbon isotope, is a nearshore to offshore uh, signature. So these, these are uh, amphipods and uh, round gobies that were captured, you know, really close to shore. And uh, that contrasts with these offshore items like your, your sculpins at the top there, um, alewife and smelt and that second bubble, um, zooplankton. So this is uh, one of the indications we can get here is where a fish is eating based on its carbon signature. 
Uh, and then the, the nitrogen signature, which is this y-axis, provides an indication of the position in the food chain or trophic level. And uh, this is pretty easy to see. This, this bubble here is zooplankton and, and mussels. And if we go up about three, three and a half units of nitrogen, you get the things that eat zooplankton, the, the alewife, the smelt. Um, and then if you go up about three units from that, you get the salmon and trout, which are feeding on the alewife and the smelt and, and other things. So um, that kind of gives us an indication of what these data are telling us. And so the first thing to look at just from this biplot amongst those salmon and trout is uh, similarities and differences. And the biggest difference here is that that lake trout in green is about uh, is, is higher than the rest of the salmon and trout. Uh, by about the same factor that uh, those salmon and trout are higher than large alewife in terms of their nitrogen signatures. So that, that's really an indication that lake trout have a fairly unique um, foraging pattern, uh, particularly focused on offshore um, deep fish, that's that the prey items that are likely driving that nitrogen level up. Now they're still obviously eating a fair bit of alewife, but they're incorporating enough other diet items that they have a, a fairly substantial difference in, in the nitrogen signature compared to um, this cluster of the other four species. Um, another thing we can do is instead of trying to interpret what the fish are eating is to actually use the isotopes directly to look at the overlap in prey and energy signatures. And so uh, the way we do this is by plotting out all the data. So in this figure, each data point is a, a, an isotopic signature from an individual fish. Um, with different colors for different species. And we can look at the likelihood that any one of these particular dots comes from the range occupied by the dots of the different species. So if, if we wanna focus on a lake trout Chinook salmon comparison, we could ask what is the percentage of those green dots that occur within the space occupied by the dark blue dots, the green dots being lake trout and the dark blue dots being Chinook salmon. Um, we can simplify this then by trying to encapsulate these individual data points by ellipses, which is what we've done here. This is the exact same data, except now instead of an individual data point, you're looking at an ellipse that's showing the area occupied by the vast majority of those data points. And then assessing the potential for competition boils down to a Venn diagram. Um, so in this case, uh, again, I'm highlighting this trout salmon example. That's the, that's the area in black uh, in this figure here. And th that black area is the overlap between the lake trout in green and the Chinook salmon in blue. Um, and it, it's showing here that isotopically anyway, uh, there is about 16 to 38% overlap here. Those numbers are, are derived based on the percentage of each ellipse occupied by that black space. So um, that black area is 16% of the green lake trout ellipses and 38% of the blue Chinook salmon ellipses. Now, um, just to kind of summarize this table, this table is kind of showing this for all of the species. Um, and what we saw is that lake trout had a pretty low probability of uh, occurring within the same isotopic space of Chinook salmon, coa salmon, or steelhead. That doesn't mean that they aren't foraging on the same food items because that is happening to some extent, but it does indicate that the lake trout have a pretty unique um, foraging pattern compared to these other animals. Uh, there was moderate overlap between the lake trout and the brown trout and a high overlap between the Chinook salmon, coa salmon, and steelhead. Now, the isotopes aren't just what you eat, but where you eat. So that could be some of the differences here as well. Um, if say the lake trout are feeding deeper and the Chinook salmon are feeding shallower, that could be driving some of these differences as well. Um, and the, the last slide I wanna show on this, at least I'm pretty sure this is the last, yep, last slide I wanna show on this is, um, a slide that actually was put together by Ben Tershak, who's a biologist with Michigan DNR. So uh, the, the prior slides all showed data that we collected in 2014. Um, this was continued on in 2015 and 16, and Ben has done a great job at uh, analyzing all these data. Um, he's found that the, the patterns that we observed are consistent, at least over this three-year time frame. So that's, that's uh, good in the sense that it gives us a, a good sense, a high level of confidence that this is what's going on. Um, what he did is he also corrected for that expected difference between predator and prey in terms of nitrogen. So in this case, the predator bubbles are lining up directly over the prey um, that they would be eating. And so uh, what this figure is showing that that kind of that golden banana in the middle there is all centered on alewife. So of course, all the species are overlapping on alewife and, and that's a no brainer. But uh, what we are seeing uh, for this lake trout uh, is really that, that evidence that round goby, ROG, 
uh, Rainbow Smelt, RBS, and Bloater, BLO, are also occupying portions of the lake trout diet. And, and those are the items that are driving up that nitrogen signature and giving it that uniqueness compared uh, to the other species. Um, this is also showing that both lake trout and brown trout have rather large ellipses, which indicates generalist foraging and a more diverse diet. And you can see the brown trout are overlapping with both alewife and goby. Um, whereas the coho salmon and the steelhead are being pulled downward, probably by that TER that represents terrestrial invertebrates, which uh, uh, is something that we've seen in, in steelhead and, and somewhat in coho, um, with the Chinook salmon almost centered entirely on, on alewife. So um, it, it gives us a really strong indication of what's going on there with the diet. Um, and again, supports this conclusion that lake trout, brown trout, and steelhead appear to be the most resilient and adaptive to these ongoing forage changes. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention. I 